welcome to the Pod of Inquiry, pushing the envelope for human understanding and optimization, the podcast for podiatrists. The Pod of Inquiry is designed to empower you with knowledge. What happens from there is up to you. Your host, Dr. Stephen Barrett, has designed this show to take you down some very deep rabbit holes, hopefully bringing you back out again, relatively unscathed, but cerebrally whipped, enabling a better understanding of all things worthy of inquiry. If you have more questions after the show, then that is good. The new discovery today many times was the new discovery 50 years ago, only to be suppressed or plainly ignored. Medicine and surgery can sometimes take a long while to get their paradigm shifted. We hope to have a lot of fun on this show and maybe destroy some ridiculous dogma along the journey. Thanks for joining the show today. Let's start spelunking. My guest today is Dr. Forrest Tennant again, and this is the continuation from episode one of The Pot of Inquiry. If you've not listened to that episode, I highly encourage you to go back to the back button now, and then after finishing the first part of our discussion in episode one, come back and join us on this one. Dr. Tennant is the current editor emeritus of Practical Pain Management and was the editor of that publication from 2002 until 2018. As an internal medicine specialist with a focus in addiction, Dr. Tennant set up some of the first methadone clinics in the United States in the 1970s. He has more than 100 scientific abstracts and posters and has published more than 200 peer-reviewed journal articles. He truly is an expert in pharmacological addiction and pain management to the extent that the United States government recruited him to oversee the medical forensics of Howard Hughes' death and was also retained to successfully defend Elvis Presley's physician in a criminal trial after Elvis's tragic death. Dr. Tennant has not only served medicine and pain management well over the last five decades, but he has served as the mayor of his city, West Covina, California. He has won awards not only for his community service, but many for his medical contributions over the last five decades. In today's episode, we discuss the pros and cons of advancing technology, treating patients metabolically instead of symptomatically, inflammation and autoimmunity, palmitatoyl ethanolamide, and other supplementations, some controversies about pain, the worst pain there is, how do you actually ad- diagnose adhesive arachnoiditis, and so much more. I know you will enjoy this episode as we were able to tie some things together from episode one. Again, I could not have a better guest than my friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Forrest Tennant. Please enjoy our discussion. Well, and it's changed the perspective, too. I I remember probably around 2010, we implemented for a short period of time in our practice pharmacogenetic testing. And you'd have these folks that would come in and they would say, listen, um, coding doesn't work for me. And your first thought automatically is this is a drug seeker, because that's what we've been taught. Somebody comes in, they name the medications that don't work, and they name the medication that they want. You, you have this perception that uh, they're a drug seeker. And then all of a sudden you run a, pharma, a pharmacogenetic test on them and they don't have any uh, P452D6 or 3A4 enzyme and they can't metabolize codeine into morphine. And that's why they, they don't want it. Not necessarily because they're a drug seeker, but it'd be interesting because then we would just write directly for morphine sulfate for those folks and they did perfectly fine. Um, but then the insurance companies came in and said, we're not going to pay for that anymore. So I think, you know, it's, it's difficult now to be a physician and to take care of the patient at the same time, treating the computer through the electronic medical records burden, as well as, you know, treating their, their third party insurance that will pay for something or won't. But in, in, and it, it kind of turned me around. And then the other thing that at the same time, we, Unfortunately, we had to kind of discontinue the pharmacogenetic testing because it was just too expensive for people in, in, unless it was a rare case. But we would also, a lot of times, when these folks would come in after a bunionectomy or, or some surgery that at two weeks, they should have been really not needing much um, narcotic at that standpoint. And we'd have them do a urine test right then and there. And all of a sudden, there's no drug in that urine. And there's the boyfriend 
or the husband sitting right there next to him in the treatment room telling me how much pain they're having. This was a horrible surgery. And you look at it, there's no, there's no cellulitis. Everything's perfect. Why are they needing this much pain medication? Well, it's because they were duping us that they needed this medication to get it to their significant other because that person had a, a problem. So I just think that the whole thing really needs to be handled with a lot of, you know, um, I guess knowing the patient, you know, really taking time to figure out why this patient's asking for a drug, why they're demanding more medication at some point in time. And then all of a sudden, after that negative urine test where there was no opioids in the urine, there was never a request, funny as it should seem, never, never another request by that patient for more opioids. So, you know, there's things that we can, I, I guess the point of all of that is that we have to, you know, maybe we're all products of what is beaten into us, the dogma that we've been brought up in. And then when you start looking at some of these things and start implementing some of these other modalities that we hadn't thought about, um, it gives you a, a better take. But my, my take home message is that there's a lot of people out there still suffering in pain that maybe necessarily wouldn't have to if we had a little bit more judicious approach with some of these, these things. Uh, you, you said it all very well, and I agree with everything that you said. Uh, I, I do want to make a couple of points, of which one is not going to be very well accepted by a lot of people today. But you, you brought up one point that really needs to be said, and it's a sad one. Today, we have such diagnostic technology that we can diagnose a lot of things. The genetic cytochrome testing is a good example. The new cytokine panels, the new hormone panels, the new MRIs, these things are so expensive, but they're so good. Mm -hmm. and, and all us practitioners, we want the best for patients. Absolutely. In, in other words, I have yet to see a patient that I could afford to get or ask the insurance company to pay for all the tests I wanted. So we have come to this situation to where we've got the tech diagnostic technology, but it is so expensive at this time, we can't use it like we'd like to. So that's, that's a problem, and I hope it goes positive on us. Well, to, to, to back that up, I'll give you a, a, an example that happens in our practice once a month, and that is we'll have somebody with intractable pain Mm -hmm. And we'll do a, a trial stimulation for a peripheral nerve stimulator. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, I've never felt this good in five years since my injury, or it's 50% better. I could, yeah. I could get back to it. And they have, you've documented right there with this 15, 20 minute clinical trial that you're able to reduce their pain with a peripheral nerve stimulator and their insurance will then deny that stimulator. And not that many people have the ability to, to, pay, to, pay, to for pay for it. And if we're spending all of these millions of dollars on the, you know, fight against injudicious use of opioids, why not maybe shift some of those healthcare dollars to actually um, technologies that will, in fact, decrease the necessity for these drugs? It's a, it's a paradigm shift, yep. but... That's right. Well, you're, what you're saying is, and we've got to go this direction, and I think society will, but it, it's so painful to make that shift. But let me also address something else that you just said. When the computer age began in medical practice, uh, it has led to the electronic medical record, but it's, and that's got its pros and cons, and I want to tell you, when it comes to preventing overdoses and abuse of drugs, the medical record is a hazard, not a help. Well, I, I, could, I, I would argue more on the con side, but go ahead. Yeah, and I'll kind yeah. of tell you why. But the other, uh, the other thing that it's brought about is this belief that you can make a diagnosis simply on symptoms, and that's not true. Even during the pandemic, and we've all made great use of uh, Skype and of uh, uh, the television to 
examine patients far away or fields or not have you come in. But there is no still good excuse, no substitute for having a practitioner examine physically the patient, take the history, have the family, and then begin treatment one step at a time. There is this belief out there, and it's being propagated right now by high-tech, big-money interest, that we don't need to even see a practitioner, just have them fill out a form, put it on a computer, the computer will tell you what to give, and then we'll be fine. And you have, you have electronic medical records now that will ask you a few symptoms, but you really can't tell what, that, that that person has come in there with bruises all over them or coming sedated or has no family support. In other words, this idea that we can get away from personal contact in medical practice is, is going to cause a lot of problems, a lot of hazards. Because let me tell you the bottom line, people are advocating that we treat only on symptoms, not a diagnosis. In pain management, one of our major problems, and this is not known to the public, is that people are going to pain clinics being given opioids, benzodiazepines, stimulants, all kinds of drugs, and do not have a diagnosis. The diagnosis is chronic pain. That's not a diagnosis. No. That is a symptom of some diagnosis. Right. And so we have been beating the gong, or I have been, and I'm going to beat it again. What is the diagnosis here? Back pain is not a diagnosis. No. Failed back is not a diagnosis. No. Radiculopathy is not a diagnosis. Degenerative spine is not a diagnosis. We have the technology to determine a diagnosis and do it without a lot of expensive tests. So the idea of medicine is age old. That's still a phys physical exam. That's still a history. That's still symptoms. That's a physical exam. And that's a family member, not the boyfriend that they just met down the street or in the bar last night. I'm talking about a, a first degree loved one who is there to support and help you confirm the diagnosis. and. We've gotten away from this, and people think that we can substitute this basic system with technology, and we can't. No, I, I totally agree with you. I can't tell you how many times a patient will thank me for actually physically examining them. Yes. You're the first doctor that I've seen that actually touched me. I know. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And then the, the second thing that I hear all the time is he actually listened to me. And so we spend a lot of time in, in the HPI for these complex nerve patients. It's a new patient visits one hour. And in, in a traditional practice, it's impossible to spend one hour with a patient. But if you don't spend that time really going into the HPI, it's like a crime scene. You have to gather all of the sure. data you possibly can to, I guess, to, to help you start barking up the right tree or at least the tree that's next to the right tree so that you can make a diagnosis. I, like chronic pain, you're, you're absolutely right, yep. is a symptom. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a diagnosis. What's causing that chronic pain? Same thing with peripheral neuropathy. Well, what the hell does that mean? It means something's wrong with a nerve in the periphery. That's all it means. That's all it means. Yeah. And be like you and I are sitting here going, you have a vehicle. Oh, yeah, I've got a vehicle. What kind of vehicle do you have? Oh, I've got a horse and buggy. <laughs> oh, I got a Ferrari. Well, you see the nomenclature. But here's, here's the interesting thing that I've learned over my nearly 36 years in this process is that insurance companies have driven this somewhat because they will not pay for a procedure unless it's matched up to a diagnosis code that they like. An example is in peripheral nerve blocks, they want a diagnosis of other chronic pain. Well, what the hell does that mean? It means nothing, right? So we have, but in order for us to get paid for that nerve block, we have to have a code that, that works. So you've got big tech or big insurance or whatever you want to call them through these giant EMRs that is, they're just a regurgitation of so much useless information from visit to visit in order to just get the the necessary amount of words on the paper so that it, it qualifies for a 213 visit or whatever. So I mean people want to talk about, you know, getting healthcare better for the end user, the patient. 
these would be things that I would think that you would want to address. Steve, that's all very well said. Uh, my question, I guess, to you is, uh, do, do you believe the insurance companies will move in this direction? Uh, no. Maybe I'm just Pollyannish, but I hope so. Do oh, you? no, I don't think they will. Um, what's their motivation to? Mm -hmm. And, that, and I'm, not a, I'm not an insurance expert. or I, I, I mean, I almost get, you know, shingle-like symptoms when I hear the word insurance company because it's like, I don't even want to go into that sphere. I just want to take care of these patients and figure out what's what. But it's a, necess it's a necessary evil that we have to deal with. But I think you're right um, on so many fronts is that we are symptom treaters. We're not whole body treaters. And, and it, this is what I learned 20 years ago is that we could do some pretty miraculous things with, you know, isolated peripheral nerve surgeries. But some patients got grand slams. Other patients, it was a strikeout. And most of the patients would get 70% relief. Well, why wouldn't they get 100% when the other guy would get 100%? So then we started looking at, well, what's this person like metabolically, right? What's their insulin resistance? No one's taking time anymore regardless of specialty, to really look at what is the status of this patient from an overall health standpoint. Because it's amazing if we get them better from just a general metabolic standpoint, they're going to heal faster. They're, I mean, we know these things. So I think that leads into, you know, a lot of the discussions about chronic pain, right? I mean, if you can get them walking and exercising, it seems to have a pretty therapeutic effect. Yeah. Well, no question. And I guess also to what's another way of what you're saying is patients better take care of themselves a little better. Yes. And, and have to. And, and, and today, because of all the problems you're talking about, the overload of patients, the inability to get things paid for, all these issues that everybody knows about, it is imperative that patients and families understand the disease they have if they have a chronic disease, mm -hmm. and particularly a chronic painful disease. Right. They're going to have to know the name of their disease. They're going to have to understand where it came from, why it is there, and understand that uh, you have to do more than just ask for a prescription or, a, or surgery done at the doctor's office. Uh, I have recently started something that you would think it wouldn't be controversial. But that is, I have been saying, if you have a chronic painful condition, you have a three-component protocol. Uh, number one, you've got to reduce your inflammation and autoimmunity. Number two, you've got to regenerate damaged tissue. And number three, you've got to have pain control. Now, you wouldn't think those three things would be controversial because they've only been used since Christ, the time of Christ. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is not new, folks. This is the way medicine's always been. But do you know that though, if you state those three criteria components, as I just did, it's extremely controversial. What's controversial there? They don't like the... Uh, it is amazing that... I, and I'm not 100% certain, but the whole idea that you are going to do all three uh, somehow is not only offensive, but actually adversarial to certain people in our society and to certain components of the medical system. Uh, in other words, uh, you would be shocked about how many people do not believe in suppressing or reducing autoimmunity and inflammation. Mm. That is not something that you've got a whole bunch of physicians and organizations that don't believe in that. Well, you, let's talk about that a second, because you and I have been talking over the last day about, you know, this cytokine panel that you're very excited about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things we know with peripheral nerve uh, pathology is there's always some component of neuroinflammation. But we look at the, you know, high sensitivity CRP, the uh, SED rate, the homocysteine. The, there's not a whole lot of markers that we can really look at from an assessment of inflammatory status. So let's talk about the cytokine panel, because I think sure. that has a lot of applicability. Well, I think the first uh, in inflammatory marker in the body was developed back in around the 1926 or so called the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's a rather crude rate, but still very useful, still got a place. 
And then there was something called a reactive protein called the C-reactive protein, and inflammation would activate that. It's used for both cardiac monitoring as well as joint or all, all kinds of inflammation. And these have been good markers, but we needed something that was better, meaning something that would pick up low levels of inflammation on a test to let the practitioner and the patient and family know that we are not where we should be. In other words, anybody who's followed any advances in medical science knows that almost all chronic medical conditions are tied to inflammation. Mm -hmm. And now we know that it's tied to autoimmunity. And people are, because thanks to the COVID virus, they're starting to understand a lot more about autoimmunity and post-infectious autoimmunity, which is not a new concept, but one that's not well known to the public. And inflammation and autoimmunity are tied together. But I don't know exactly why the concept of suppressing autoimmunity and inflammation would be either controversial or unwanted, but uh, it, it does happen that way. Now, when it comes to regeneration of damaged tissues, I, I'm not... To me, this is a no-brainer. Another term for it is healing. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or, or curing. Right. And the you still have people out there spreading the misconception that you can't regenerate damaged tissue. Especially That's what nerve. exercise does. That's what nutrition does. That's what psychological therapies do. you got to try to rebuild damaged tissue. And so I don't know why this would be so controversial. It may well be that, yeah, in some cases we use such things as anabolic steroids or hormones or, or electromedical devices uh, to regenerate damaged tissue. And, and so I don't know why this, the term would even be controversial, but apparently it is. Uh, and and so you, you put together the you're suppressing or reducing inflammation and autoimmunity, trying to regenerate tissues. Pain control is just symptomatic, so you can do the other two. Right. And right. Uh, and then uh, uh, for guy's sakes, I mean, if you stop and think about it, that's what our new surgery does. You're trying to regenerate tissue, uh, healing it. You're trying to do all these things, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. So the the protocol of dealing with chronic disease or chronic painful disease is not new, but uh, I'm doing my best to try to bring up uh, what Hippocrates said many, many years ago. <laughs> Let food be thy medicine? No, just the three, pro the, okay. the, the, the three components. Right. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about how to treat that uh, inflammation. You mentioned something to me um, about this uh, new supplement called PEA, and I don't oh. even want to try to pronounce it because I'll, I'll butcher the term, but you can oh. roll it out pretty oh, sure. well. Well, one of the nice uh, scientific advances is that some research scientists have discovered that the body makes a chemical. Uh, it's a, technically, it's a fatty acid. It's not a hormone. It's a, not a neurotransmitter. But the body makes a chemical called palmitoy ethanolamide. Uh, usually called PEA because it's so darn hard to pronounce or spell. And when you get pain or inflammation, the body makes this in certain tissues and puts it into the blood. And the idea is to use this compound is what all of we humans use to suppress inflammation and heal our pain. So let me ask you a couple of questions on the PEA then. As we age, we tend to make less things. We make less testosterone. We make less nitric oxide. We make less glutathione. These are all things that we were designed with when we were young to, to fight inflammation, mm -hmm. which um, we're going to feed the fire of inflammation every day we're a human because we do things that is, there, that, that, there's some tissue trauma of some form. But as we get older, our, our mechanism to make glutathione, nitric oxide, these other things decreases as part of the aging process so do you think that from a longevity standpoint now not just a pain management that there is at some point where pea starts to drop off and we need to just routinely supplement that don't know about <clears throat> routinely we don't know enough about it so far except we know it's very safe okay and let me say one of the movement that's going on out there for both safety reasons and effective reasons and cost reasons, 
We have a lot of people out there, a lot of new entrepreneurial companies around the globe, not just in the United States, but in Europe, uh, Britain, Australia, uh, uh, China, that are trying to bring back a lot of old herbal and botanical uh, products. Right. And a lot of them work. I mean, they've identified, I could give you the name of a half a dozen good herbal anti-inflammatory uh, pain relievers. And I'm sorry if this cuts out the profits of some company I might have stock in, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, right. the, uh, these new these herbal products that are being brought back from centuries of use long ago, uh, I could name you a few of them. Uh, uh, curcumin is very popular, serapeptase, uh, luteolin, uh, reservatol, there's a, uh, and some others. And these, this is a very good movement. Uh, uh, for example, one that's not well appreciated, but it's kind of cute, uh, the three wise men who brought uh, frankincense and mirror and, uh, to the Christ child, uh, frankincense was a plant known as Boswellia. Well, you can now buy Boswellia in the health food store. It's a darn good, good drug for pain, uh, mild forms of pain. So you have on the market today a lot of non-prescription uh, herbal agents, uh, pain agents, this has been a very, very good movement because people do need to know how to take care of their minor pains, even their lesser chronic pains, or to mix them. And this discovery of palmitoy ethanolamide, which is natural in the blood of all humans, uh, is one that uh, I use it all the time. In fact, I recommend that right out front for anybody with chronic pain. Even if they're already on an opioid like a morphine, you can add that to it. We get it? Uh, again, it's a little controversial, but this whole movement of uh, CBD products and medical marijuana, uh, a lot of people are getting pain relief uh, with that. And then there's another herbal product called Kratom out there that's got a lot of uh, pain relieving activity. So uh, I think there's a lot of good self-help going on out there, and I think there should be, because uh, pain is just something that we all put up with. And I think everybody, whether they've got mild, intermittent, Pain uh, from a bunion or a carpal tunnel or whatever it is, great. They can treat themselves. They don't need a doctor to do that. Uh, then you're going to have the terrible end other stages in which we physicians are going to have to step in. Uh, and, what, and I'm bringing this up because somehow or another, we tend to have certain sources of media, of media in this country who are trying to sort of say that pain's all the same. No. And they're yeah. not. Right. It's, it's a wide, wide spectrum. Right. And uh, you'd read certain articles these days that uh, yeah, just take some acupuncture and mindfulness or uh, uh, go to a, some kind of a, a massage therapist and you're just going to be fine. Well, that's not true. It's going to help certain people, but there's severities of pain and these people are forgotten. Yes. And so uh, I, one of my messages is get real, folks. You've got some people out there who have pain beyond comprehension. Yeah, And they're going to need the very best that we have to give them. And it's going to be expensive. It's going to be, it's going to need specialists. And so we've got those people out there. Now, this idea, oh, well, they shouldn't be treated. They're just costing society a lot of money and they ought to just go ahead and die off. Uh, I know that's an attitude out there. But uh, those of us who are physicians don't count on us to buy into that. <laughs> right. <laughs> We're right. going to try to keep people, uh, our job is to keep them comfortable and give them some longevity and a quality of life. And, and, and again, this is another controversy. I've gotten big criticisms from people, from everybody, from the societies that believe in assisted suicide to government agencies that we shouldn't be keeping these people alive. And, and I'm here to bring up a terribly sensitive issue, and that is this idea that we have too much population and we have people who are too disabled and who can't work and aren't productive, and so they shouldn't get the best of medical care. Now, if that's a political decision, that's fine. But don't ask us doctors to participate in that belief. Uh, at least don't ask me. <laughs> well, I, I, and you know, they, they, the thing that I have seen... Um, unfortunately, is that there are, there are some modalities that are available in other states that, that have been extremely good. And I'm talking about these very, very severe recalcitrant pain patients. And 
you know, they're, they, they have zero quality of life. They, they can't do anything. They're so debilitated. Um, but they'll go out of state and uh, they'll go get a psilocybin uh, treatment up in Oregon, or they get lucky enough to get put in one of the clinical trials at Emory or Harvard. And, and all of a sudden, you know, their life has been totally changed. But until that lucky uh, opportunity came for them, they were pretty much not willing to live. They, if they could have, if somebody would have given them a, a Kevorkian cocktail, they would have slurped it down faster than you can imagine because they're in such a miserable state, some of these people. So I think it's a slippery slope, yes, but um, I, I think at the same time, and I'm not trying to advocate for illegal or illicit uses of drugs, but I think that we really need, if we want to solve this crisis of, of recalcitrant pain and, and opioid overdoses, that there needs to be some look at the psychedelics um, for some of these mental conditions that are, are correlative with pain. I mean, how many patients did you see in your career, uh, very severe pain patients that did not have some type of a psychological overlay? Um, it was probably none. Well, you know? if you develop chronic pain, you're going to have psychological overlay if you want to call it that. No right. question. Before we continue with this great discussion, I just want to take a quick break to acknowledge this week's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Savant Sellers, providers of boutique tier one reds at a tier two price point. Let's imagine you are spelunking in a cave out in Napa Valley and you come across some of the juice from Savant Cellars, you may just never want to come out until it's gone. Savant Cellars sources all of their fruit from the really big name boutique vineyards. That's right, where the elites get their fruit. If we put a vineyard designation on our bottles, we would be contractually forced to sell our wines at three to four times our current pricing. Yes, full disclosure, I am one of the three principals and I'm very proud of our wines. Savant Cellars, is the genius of wine. Simply great wines, vintage after vintage, crafted in a Bordeaux style so you can lay them down for years or drink them now. They simply just get better. Use the code SPELUNK15 to get a 15% discount at SavantCellars.com. That is C-E-V-A-N-T Cellars.com. SPELUNK15. Well, let's talk about the suicide issue for a moment. And I'm going to relate a story that uh, might be surprising. It was to me, and it might be to you. Most people have heard of Dr. Kevorkian. Yes. Some years ago, when he was still alive, he called me. Wow. He called me up, and he said, You know, Dr. Tennant, I have some clients that they tell me if they could just get pain treatment, they wouldn't need my services. Mm -hmm. Could I send them to you? And so guess what? You I took, took some patient. referrals from Dr. Kevorkian. Some are still alive. Right. And uh, again, I personally and morally, I, I can't participate in that. But I can tell you one thing. I'm actually a consultant to two or three suicide groups. Okay. And people are going to have to make that decision very personally. Right. There, and I guess it'll be like abortion. There are certain states, there are certain countries that the body politic, the citizenry, accept suicide. They, uh, and they even encourage it in some ways. Now, what I'm, I guess what I'm asking for, if they want those beliefs, that's one society has to make on their own. Maybe you vote for it, but I can't participate in it. Right. And what I and what I tell people, and I've, if you've been in the pain business as long as I have been, you see suicide as something that uh, it's just it's it's out there. Mm -hmm. And I've had many many discussions uh, with people about it. Some went on to do it. Some of my discussions uh, kept some from not doing it. Right. And uh, whenever I have to discuss that issue with a patient, I've always said, "Look, I want to give you my bias." My bias is that we keep going on while you're alive, but you've got to make that decision with you and your God and your family. Right. And uh, so I guess society has that issue to, to go over. Uh, but what I do resent is that when people say they're going to, just like Dr. Kevorkian, 
he didn't, as he put it very well, if they can get pain relief and that's what they want, they don't need my service. Mm -hmm. That still exists. Right. I hate to see somebody commit suicide because they can't get a simple prescription for some Valium and morphine. That's tragic. And there's where I put, draw the line. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with you. And, you know, we've seen, you know, the cases where they could not get their opioids any longer. And so they had to go out and get them um, on the street and they're now on heroin and, yeah. you know, and, and so it's, um, it's a tragedy. That's for sure. Let's talk about arachnoiditis because that is one of your projects right now. And I think, uh, a lot of, uh, podiatrists and lower extremity surgeons would benefit from a little discussion about, about what you're doing with arachnoiditis. Well, arachnoiditis, let's talk about what it is first. First, it is not a spider bite. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, the arachnoid is actually a tissue that lines the brain and the spinal cord and the spinal canal. And it was called arachnoid because after they invented the microscope a couple of centuries ago, they looked at it and it looks like a spider web. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the name came from. It was named in a, at least the Lippincott Dictionary of 1873 defines it as inflammation of the arachnoid membrane. That definition still holds today. What people do not know is that the arachnoid lining of the spinal canal can attach to the nerves and cause a mass because adhesions are there, and it's a nerve entrapment sort of thing where spinal canal nerve roots get attached to the spinal canal cover. It's called adhesive arachnoiditis. So how does that, from an anatomical standpoint, the arachnoid layers between the dura uh, superficially and the pia mater, yeah. right? So does, is there an interruption in the, in the pia mater like there is in the endovascular yeah. epithelium in order for it to go through that next layer to get that adhesion? Yeah, they've got to grow together through adhesions and inflammation and trauma. Something bad has to happen. Now, let me tell you why I'm studying it. Okay. Adhesive arachnoiditis has replaced RSD and metastatic bone cancer as the most severe pain in society. It's number one, big daddy. No pain exceeds adhesive arachnoiditis. I'm the old man in the field, so I'll study it. So I've decided, for me, my challenge is let's take on the worst pain there is and see what we can come up with. And I'm pleased to say we're coming up with some things. Uh, that's the disease you don't want. Also, once you've seen a few cases of adhesive arachnoiditis, you, you've just got to believe that, that this has got to be prevented. Uh, th this is just terrible. Uh, it's, uh, like I say, in my career, I've seen the bone pains. I've seen the gunshots, uh, the war injuries. I've seen the, the RSDs, uh, uh, the Eilers Danlos. So I've been down. I've seen all these things and treated all these things. But adhesive arachnoiditis is the worst of the day. So we're going to work on that. So if we, figure, if we can figure out how to deal with adhesive arachnoiditis, we can figure out how to deal with slip discs and uh, neuropathies and uh, arthritis and, and genetics and what have you. And I'm pleased to say that we've at least got protocols for it now. We don't have any curves. We don't have any specific drugs for it. But we're certainly finding out that there are certain exercises, diets, medications, uh, that uh, really do help it. So you, you mentioned when we had discussion last evening about the fact that this is really kind of a tertiary disease or a tertiary syndrome, yeah. that something has to set up the, uh, the situation for this to develop, usually after a lumbar puncture or epidural injection or something like that, right? And you were talking about maybe reactivation of Epstein-Barr, Give me some more insight sure. on that. Adhesive arachnoiditis is the end product of a bunch of bad things that happen to you, okay? You can start off with Eilers Danlos, a genetic disease. You can start off with a auto accident. You can start off with some slip discs. Then you can catch uh, an infection called Epstein-Barr or infectious mononucleosis and develop autoimmunity from that. 
You can get Lyme disease. You got to have two or three bad things happen to you, and that's what gives you that. It'll glue the spinal canal cover to the nerve roots, and then you've got it. Uh, and, and so, and, and sometimes it happens inadvertently. Uh, at the time, let's say a woman has to get an epidural shot at delivery mm -hmm. or even an epidural shot for uh, chronic discs or something like that. And little does it know that the poor doctor who's doing it, he gets blamed, but it's not his fault because the person's got autoimmunity, right. maybe, and then all of a sudden they've introduced some other trauma to it. So it's got uh, multiple causes. You don't just get any one cause of it. It's related to multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis affects the spinal cord up in the thoracic area usually, uh, uh, but this is down in the lumbar area. Can occur in the neck, but it's mainly in the lumbar sacral area. Uh, so these folks are set up by these other conditions. Yes. Uh, it's a kind of a dry tender situation. Absolutely. If if the uh, forest was wet, that's and right. It would you know somebody dropped a cigarette, it wouldn't be any problem, but. You get a lumbar puncture, you get rear-ended in a car, yep. and now all of a sudden you got a problem. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it's my hope that we can prevent this so we never see mm. another case. And uh, one of the things that, uh, it's good news, bad news, but what's made my desire to work with this and the, at the end of my career has to do with the new MRI technology. Right. Now, that technology was invented in about 1987, and they've been getting it better all the time. It's gotten so good that what they call a contrast MRI, meaning you can see the spinal fluid and the nerve roots independently mm -hmm. and the spinal canal cover. And it's like neon sign once you learn what you're looking at. And now that we can look at that, a lot of these people that we were calling failed back syndromes or chronic back or even psychological problems have this condition, and you can see it. And uh, we've been at it now. We've had our research project about three or four years, and we're already starting to see a lot of results. We've taken a look at MRIs from 48 countries, uh, including uh, uh, our adversaries of China, Iran, and Russia. Uh, because uh, those people have it there also. Uh, and we've uh, figured out some ways to uh, start uh, preventing it and identifying it early. That's the big key, to get it identified early, because if it gets to what we call stage three or four, these people are bed-bound, they're paralyzed, they're incontinent, they're in the worst pain that you can get, and they die young. So you, yeah, you, yeah. you gave a great lecture at one of our ANS uh, symposiums a couple of years ago on this, and I recall the MRIs that you showed me, and you could see the cauda equina pushed to one side and, and stuck. It was pretty easy to look at that MRI and see that this wasn't really a normal distribution of how that cauda should look. Uh, but aside from MRIs, uh, how, how should folks look at this from a clinical diagnosis? Because okay, you, you, gave, you gave some great pearls in that lecture. Uh, well, first off, uh, I should tell you how I sort of got interested in it myself. Uh, the tip-off for me, and this might sound kind of funny, because I got a t I'll illustrate it by a phone call I got two days ago. I got a phone call from a lady in Texas, and she said she was happy to get a hold of me, but she needed to talk to me because she woke up that morning, and she thought urine was running down her leg. She looked, and she didn't have any urine on her leg. And then a little later, she thought there were bugs crawling on her leg. So let me tell you right now, if you think spiders are crawling on your leg or urine is there and there's no urine or water there, you probably got it. Okay. <laughs> so that's a funny symptom. That And it's usually bilateral, no, not unilateral. Usually unilateral. Unilateral. Okay. Oh, one leg. Okay. And so anybody who has that symptom, be thinking of arachnoiditis right out front. That's one, one bizarre symptom that people do get. Uh, another thing that they'll get is, uh, you wouldn't think so, but they get blurred vision. Hmm. And you wouldn't think you'd get blurred vision from a back problem. But it had, we didn't know this when I got into this, but the spinal fluid is made in the brain and goes down this spinal canal like a pipe and then back up. Right. And uh, this is a mass in the canal. And it interferes with the spinal fluid flow, and it turns out the eye fluid in your eye is connected to your spinal fluid in the canal. And so they can get blurred vision. 
Uh, so you get some of those funny things. But the, but the big one that I want every medical practitioner and even every patient or never, anybody who's got chronic back problems, if you've got a back problem that is bad enough to take medication every day, you better be evaluated for adhesive arachnoiditis. And so really then... You have these, these couple of symptoms. Is there any provocation sign that you can do on the patient in the exam room that, like, you know, uh, you know some type of leg raise? Yeah. or If you try to raise the leg and it hurts, think arachnoiditis. Okay. 90% of them will have what they call straight leg, leg pain. Yeah. 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 They will get that. Uh, and so these are just some of the simple things. But what's important today is the number of people who undergo one back surgery after another, one epidural after another. Now, keep in mind that the doctors that do these usually do them for good medical indication. Right. But unfortunately, they may do a second back surgery or a third or fifth or tenth MR epidural because they don't know what else to do. And so they do these procedures and they can overdo it. So, yeah, we have some excess. But uh, not much, not as much as what people think. But again, the person who, let's say, in your, your practice or anybody's practice, you've got this patient who keeps coming in and say, Doc, my back just hurts and I just got to have that Percocet. I got to have that Vicodin. I can't live without it. Be thinking arachnoiditis. Because the average person that goes to the chiropractor the massage therapist, uh, the, the physician, the nurse practitioner, the podiatrist is not in this category. You're talking about maybe one in every 500 back pain patients. Mm. So you're not, it's not all that common. But, but today, think in terms of this disease and that person who just is in agony over their bad back. Okay. Now, uh, I'm working on Dr. John Kennedy's book right now. That's right. what he had. Right. And, uh, but that's the tip off. And I wish I'd have known this 20 years ago because I've, and do you want to talk about suicide? One of my interests in suicide is because if adhesive arachnoiditis patients don't get help, they will commit suicide. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you just are too sick and in too much pain. You will not tolerate it. So that's, uh, kind of how I got into it. So, uh, uh, the, uh, before I hang up my shingle, I hope we've learned to prevent these cases because they can be prevented because you can prevent it on several different fronts now that I understand it. So let's hope we don't get new cases. Well, I, they, they always say the easiest disease to treat is the one you don't get. Yeah, you that, that's a good way of putting you it. You know, so, yeah. um, well, Forrest, I just want to thank you for coming to Georgia and hanging out with us for a couple of days. And, uh, I've admired you ever since I saw you speak the first time at Pain Week, the way you communicate, the way you are able to spread the message to so many different providers that, that your ripple effect is huge. And right. it's, uh, it's going to continue on. The more you write these books and the way you write them, it's so easy to, to pull so much medicine out, but at the same time, just get involved in the story. So well, I just personally want to thank you for all of that. I think that you know, you've come to our meeting and lectured a few times. Uh, you have the, the anytime you want to come and talk uh, card, you can definitely do that. We, we always love to have what well, you thanks, have to say. Let me just say this in closing. I've had a nice long career, and I have one other thing that I, why I keep doing this. In my opinion today, and know, I know that the media and a lot of people wouldn't agree with this, in my travels, what I find in the United States is people care about people. Mm -hmm. The doctors, the nurses, they care about their patients. Patients care about other patients. To hear the media talk about it, everybody hates everybody else. I don't find that to be the case. And, and lastly, I, I know people say, oh, what are they teaching in medical school? And these nurses don't care. And I hear all these things. But you know what I see? the best trained medical people we've ever had. People, we've got all this technology, but people have not forgotten what we're here to do. And uh, so I just say this, I'm inspired by what I see. Uh, best doctors we've ever had, best nurses, best technology. 
You had to hear the media hear about it. We're all going to heck in a handbag. I don't see that. I travel little towns, big towns. Uh, I think if sometimes if the government and the media just leave us alone, we'll get along fine. Yeah, there's no <laughs> doubt. That might be one of the best pain relievers, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not to turn right. it on. Well, again, thanks so much for coming and, and doing this. And uh, I look forward to our next chat. I know we're going to have you another bet. one in the, in the near future. Thanks. My pleasure. I hope you all enjoyed today's show and got some truly empowering knowledge out of it. You can always follow up on anything we talked about in the show notes found at our website, podofinquiry.com. If you think you might have tickled just a few neurons inside that cerebral cortex, please spread the word to your friends and colleagues and tell them that they need to get spelunking. Also, if you can take a minute to leave a review on your podcast provider of choice, and especially Apple Podcasts, that would greatly help the show and be so appreciated, provided it's positive. And if not, then just keep your pie holes shut and stay down in that cave. Let's keep spelunking. This podcast is designed for informational purposes only. It does not constitute any medical or surgical consulting advice or imply a development of any physician-patient relationship. The opinions of guests who are featured on the show are not necessarily the opinions of Dr. Barrett or the production team. This podcast is owned solely by Barrett Medical and Surgical Media, LLC. While the show is highly oriented for physicians and healthcare providers, anyone interested in the improvement of human performance and understanding will find us a welcome goblet to sip from or guzzle. However, no representation or warranties are made in any way whatsoever on this podcast for any products, techniques, or other things discussed. Invited guests are not vetted by the pod of inquiry for their qualifications and may have a direct or indirect financial interest in what they present and discuss on the show. The pod of inquiry disclaims any responsibility from anything taken from the show and used personally or professionally. It is a responsibility of the listener to perform their own due diligence prior to the implementation of any ideas, products, techniques, or anything talked about on the show.